USCSB React. That's right, y'all. It's time for another Spamuary video where I'm attempting to make a video every single day for the month of January. In today's video, I'm gonna be reacting to the USCSB's video titled Behind the Curve. And I'm reacting to this because somebody asked me to in the subreddit. Thank you for that. Kind of running out of ideas, so I want you to post what I should react to in the subreddit. I don't take sponsors. The only thing I ask is that if you need a lawyer, contact my team for a free consultation. While most people know me as a catastrophic personal injury lawyer, I'm actually a partner at two law firms that handle way more than just catastrophic injury. If you were the victim of securities fraud, received a notification that your info was included in a data breach, developed cancer as a result of a bad drug or toxic exposure, and many other situations, we may be able to help. It's important you talk to a lawyer right away to understand your options. If your case is not the best fit with us, we can help you find a great lawyer by using our national network of attorneys. Please click the link down below for a free consultation. April 2nd, 2010. The Tesoro Refinery in Anacortes, Washington. A nearly 40-year-old heat exchanger violently ruptures, causing an explosion and fire that kills seven workers. The largest loss of life at a U.S. refinery since 2005. The Chemical Safety Board launched an investigation and determined that the heat exchanger catastrophically failed due to long-term damage from what is known as high-temperature hydrogen attack. The CSB's final report into the accident was unanimously approved at a public meeting in Anacortes on May 1, 2014. The CSB is seriously concerned by the number of deadly refinery accidents in recent years. We have concluded that extensive improvement must be made in how refineries are regulated at the state and federal levels. Joe, I want to hear something sad. This video was published in 2014, and the time period between 2014 and 2024 might have been the deadliest period at United States refineries in history. And quite frankly, that's because most refineries were built in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And instead of making these things state of the art, generally speaking, refinery owners just wait until something catastrophically fails in order to replace it. There's very little to no major preventative care, right? There might be minor preventative care, but I'm talking about major preventative care that would be obviously really expensive. And they don't do it because it is really expensive. And right from the bat, we're told it was a 40-year-old heat exchanger that blew up. I can tell where this is going. The Tesoro Refinery in Anacortes is an 800-acre facility located approximately 70 miles northwest of Seattle. The refinery produces a variety of products, including gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and asphalt. Within the refinery's naphtha hydrotreater unit, raw naphtha a light component of crude oil is treated to remove nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen impurities. Before entering the unit's reactor, the raw naphtha and hydrogen are preheated inside pressure vessels called heat exchangers. The unit contains two banks of three heat exchangers supported by a three-level steel structure. Each heat exchanger consists of a bundle of tubes inside a steel shell. Hot fluid exiting the reactor flows through the heat exchanger shell while cool fluid headed for the reactor flows inside the tubes. Heat is exchanged through the walls of the tubes. Every six months, the heat exchangers are taken offline to be cleaned because of fouling, a common occurrence when operating heat exchangers in this type of service. Okay, so what we know is that there's a process called fouling that occurs, which requires these heat exchangers to be cleaned every six months. Now. Um, a defendant might argue that, hey, we did clean these things every six months. But again, if you do that enough over time, you need a complete replacement or you will need a complete replacement. On March 28, 2010, one bank of heat exchangers was taken offline and disassembled for cleaning, while the other bank remained in service. This allowed the unit to continue to operate. By mid-afternoon on April 1st, the cleaning was complete, and operators initiated the startup of the offline bank of heat exchangers. The procedure required an inside board operator monitoring the control console, and one outside operator opening and closing large manually operated valves. 
But the heat exchangers had a history of developing leaks during startup, something that refinery personnel had come to see as normal. <sighs> There's a history of leaks, but the operators just thought that was normal. That is not good. That tells me that there was complacency, maybe a lack of training, and ultimately it falls to the manufacturer, the refinery owner. That type of lack of care cannot stand when you're dealing with something so dangerous. Operators from other nearby units were called upon to assist with the startup, including mitigation of potential leaks. Okay, so additionally, other operators from other units were called to assist. Were these other operators trained in this particular unit? Did they know what was going on? What was their relationship? Were they all employees of the refinery? Sometimes refineries have third-party contractors who work in on the premises, and sometimes there are different third-party companies between unit to unit. So these are all things that, of course, we would want to know if we were handling a case like this. Outside operator was joined by six workers from other units within the refinery. The seven workers were located around the heat exchangers, where startup activities continued past midnight. But unknown to the workers, the steel shells of the middle vessels in both banks of heat exchangers had been severely weakened due to cracking caused by high temperature hydrogen attack. This occurs when tiny hydrogen atoms diffuse into steel at a high temperature, then react with carbon in the steel to form methane gas. The larger methane molecules unable to diffuse out of the steel, accumulate, stressing the steel and over time causing fissures. In both of the middle heat exchangers, the fissures grew and connected to form large internal cracks. One such crack was 48 inches long and extended more than one third of the way through the vessel's one inch thick shell. Shortly after midnight, the temperature of the fluid exiting the tubes of the online bank of exchangers increased about 75 degrees over the span of three minutes, a temperature increase that was typical and observed in previous startups. But the middle heat exchanger was so severely weakened from high temperature hydrogen attack that it likely could not withstand the stress caused by the rapid temperature increase. At 12.35 a.m., employees working at a nearby process unit heard a loud hissing noise when vapor began to leak as the heat exchanger cracked at its weakest point. Seconds later, the exchanger violently ruptured. Hot hydrogen and naphtha vapor rapidly vented from the exchanger and spontaneously ignited upon contact with air, resulting in a massive fire that consumed the heat exchanger structure. Okay. So it's pretty evident that the heat exchanger failed in its quote-unquote normal course and scope. Right, It was doing what it had always done. It had just corroded, essentially. It's just, it's disheartening and frustrating to see just something that is so preventable happen. Three of the seven operators died at the scene. The other four operators were transported to local burn centers with severe injuries. Two died within hours. The other two succumbed within days. So... Getting into the legal aspect of it, and this is going to be crass, of course, um, you're going to file something called a wrongful death lawsuit, okay? These seven people died. They're all going to have wrongful death lawsuits. Now, that doesn't mean all lawsuits are created equal or all uh, damages awards are created equal. Uh, quite frankly, the people who died later probably have a higher damage because they had to endure days of pain and suffering. So it's not only the value of the lost life, which is priceless. Don't get me wrong. There's not enough money in the world. But you also have to factor in for the people who were burned head to toe and had to suffer in anguish for days or hours before they passed away. The CSB learned that, like other companies, Tesoro relied on data published by the American Petroleum Institute called the Nelson Curves to predict the susceptibility of the carbon steel heat exchangers to HTHA damage. They take into account process temperature, the amount of pressure contributed by hydrogen, and the kinds of materials used in constructing the equipment. Above each Nelson curve, HTHA was thought to be possible. Below each curve, HTHA was not predicted to occur. But So this is what I assume 
their defense would be in any sort of lawsuit. They would say, hey, we were following the expert recommendations as lined out by the Nelson curve, but um, that is such a weak excuse. I mean, there are so many things you can do, like checking things physically, which, you know, okay, you have this expert data report. How about let's just go look at the heat exchanger once every six months or once every year and examine the structural integrity? These are things that you should also be doing. This doesn't happen its very first time, right? The corrosion just doesn't happen. But after conducting detailed process simulations, the CSB concluded that the portion of the heat exchanger that ruptured actually had operated below the curve for carbon steel in a zone that industry guidance considered safe. And the CSB has learned of at least eight other refinery accidents where HTHA reportedly occurred below the carbon steel Nelson curve. So eight other accidents that occurred below the Nelson steel, Nelson steel corrosion curve. That tells me that curve is YouTube. The CSB determined that the carbon steel Nelson curve is inaccurate and cannot be trusted to predict the occurrence of high temperature hydrogen attack. Honestly, I know I'm jaded, but a lot of these, you know, curves or whatever, it's all just, it's industry propaganda. I don't know specifically about the Nelson curve, but I mean, they, they make up so many things to make it appear that they weren't negligent. But usually the simplest answer is the correct answer. And that's that they could have just checked and they didn't did not measure actual operating temperatures and pressures in the exchanger that failed. Instead, corrosion experts hired by Tesoro relied on design operating conditions to predict whether HTHA would occur based on the Nelson curve. Okay, so that's another person that I'm gonna add into the lawsuit. So there's Tesoro, which is the refinery, but they also hired a third party consultant who was a corrosion experts hired by Tesoro. So if I was a lawyer in this case, who are these corrosion experts? Were they a third party? Can I bring them into the lawsuit? Because Tesoro is probably going to be pointing the finger at them. They're going to be saying, hey, I did everything what I was told to do. It's just these experts who told me that what I should be doing, right? So that's, again, there's a lot of other things that we would need to assess, but I would want to know who they are, and I might consider bringing them into the case. And the CSB's process simulations indicated that when the exchangers were fouled, the actual temperatures were likely much higher than design conditions. Had Tesoro used actual process conditions when determining HTHA susceptibility of the heat exchangers, their internal policies would have required the heat exchangers to be inspected for HTHA. However, we note that inspection for HTHA is not very reliable. That is because damage to equipment may be microscopic or limited to small areas, but still be significant enough to cause catastrophic failure. The best way to prevent HTHA is by using inherently safer materials of construction that are much more resistant to high temperature hydrogen attack. The CSB recommended that the American Petroleum Institute revise its standards to prohibit the use of carbon steel equipment in HTHA susceptible service and to require verification of actual operating conditions. The safety culture of a company can have a huge influence on the actions it takes to prevent accidents. During our investigation of this accident, we discovered several instances where Tesoro's safety culture was lacking. The CSB learned that the heat exchangers had a history of leaks during startup, creating hazardous conditions for personnel working nearby. However, the CSB found that although Tesoro took some corrective actions, it never adequately fixed the leaks. Instead, Tesoro treated the leaks and fires as normal occurrences. Can you believe that? They treated the leaks and fires as normal occurrences. And I, I want to go back. And I apologize for going backwards a little bit. I just want to cover this. I know they said that the HTHA susceptibility might be hard to physically monitor because the intrusion might be microscopic. But if you remember at the beginning of the video when it failed here, they think that the corrosion was as identifiable as 48 inches long in this case. Um, and that leads me to, to the other argument, which we said at the beginning of the video, is there are better materials to use 
in situations like this and um, whatever the equipment du jour is, um, the fact of the matter is, is replacing entire systems is quite expensive. And many times man- manufacturers just straight up don't want to upgrade because their 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 version is still technically working. Okay, but I'm sorry for ranting about that. This whole thing is just, I'm getting very upset about this whole deal. It, just, it makes me sick. Tesoro took some corrective actions. It never adequately fixed the leaks. Instead, Tesoro treated the leaks and fires as normal occurrences and regularly allowed additional personnel to be present during startup to mitigate the hazards. On the night of the incident, two more leaks were reported during the exchanger startup. And the CEO. So, two leaks were reported during the incident, the startup that, that caused the incident. And that was just normal. It was just normal. SB found that the complexity of the startup procedure typically required more than just the one outside operator. Yet operating procedures were not updated to account for the role of additional personnel during the hazardous non-routine work. Seven workers, including five additional operators from other refinery units, were supporting the startup of the heat exchangers on the night of April 2nd, 2010. All were fatally injured. They literally had more workers than they needed because it was acceptable for them to have a process in which, oh yeah, we need more people to deal with these leaks when they happen. Does that... (sighs) The CSB recommended that Tesoro implement a process safety culture program that would assess and continually improve safety at the Anacortes refinery. Okay, so my review, a thousand percent liability on Tesoro. I know there was some third party consultant that they, they're probably gonna try to blame or they probably did, I don't know, but I don't care. I don't care. This makes me so mad. It makes me mad that after this, 2014 to 2024 is an extremely dangerous period because we keep seeing failures like this happen with really old equipment and processes that might have been acceptable at the time, but we have so much better, we have such a better understanding and upgrades are possible, they're just, they just cost money. And just for the sake of looking it up, I don't know if this is real or not, I just Googled it, this was the first thing that came up from the Center of Public Integrity. The families of the seven who died in Anacartas settled civil lawsuits against Tesoro and Shell for a collective $39 million in 2014. $39 million for seven deaths? I know every state's different and every facts are different, that just seems so freaking low. The whole point of these lawsuits is not only to compensate uh, the victim's families, which again is like, how do you place a value on a life? It's priceless. But you need to make it so expensive for these refineries to lose a life that they might say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's worth spending the few million dollars to upgrade our equipment so we don't have to pay that again. All right. Talk to y'all later. Bye.